Right, so let's continue. Um, next part of the first topic block is object-oriented programming. And so what I'm going to talk about now, just as a refresher for most of you, is uh, what uh, classes and objects are, encapsulation, inheritance and polymorphism, and how object-oriented design processes in general uh, should work. All right, so first of all, what's a class? A class is basically just a template, and inside that template we have variables which are placeholders for the data and we have methods which manipulate that data. And uh, from that class template we can then build an object which is a single instance of that template. That means that now each of the, the variables ha has actual concrete values. Um, we can have multiple objects uh, of one class in most cases. Um, and uh, the class usually has a so-called constructor method, which is called uh, as soon as the new object is created. So every time a new object is created, the constructor is also called and initializes, for example, the, the variables with default values. All right, so um, let's try to, to visualize this. So here we have the class, which is a template, you could also call it a blueprint, which tells you that it has a variable a, which is uh, holds an integer, and it has a variable b, which has a string, and it also has a static variable c, which uh, is again an integer. And I'll come to that in a moment. So now let's look at the objects. From that class, we can derive uh, as many objects as we want. In this case, it's, th it's a three. And for each object, we have individual values for A and B. Um, so here it's 12, 23, 1 to 3, and we have different values for the string. So each object has the same blueprint, so the same uh, types of, of data inside the variables, but different values. Um, the exception is the static uh, variable. Here, C uh, is also supposed to be an integer. and um, this is now shared across all objects. If you have static members, then they are shared. Uh, so if I change this value C inside any of these three objects, then it will also change in the other two. Um, so there's actually only one single instance of a static value. But in general, if you look at the regular class members, then uh, every object has its own copy of these regular class uh, variables and can have individual values. Static members are kind of a special case and we'll later see what we can use them for. All right, so um, next defining feature of object-oriented programming is enca encapsulation. If we use poor procedural programming, then we have so-called global state, which are our variables, and we have functions which modify that global state. And uh, if the system gets large and complex, then it's going to be hard to keep track of which of these uh, functions or methods is now actually modifying exactly which um, which variable. And if you remember from the uh, from the previous. Uh, lecture that Toyota, for example, had a big problem with uh, such side effects in their engine control code, uh, where they had something like 10,000 global variables. And each of these methods was um, basically permitted to modify each of these uh, 10,000 variables. And then it's really basically impossible to keep track of what is changed where. And this, of course, introduces errors uh, quite uh, quite quickly. Um, and to deal with this now, um, the idea is to use encapsulation. That means that uh, we put related data into a class, encapsulate that, and we can't access the uh, individual data items itself anymore. We can only uh, access them through the methods of the class, which will then um, modify the internal data items, the internal variables 
Um, but uh, other methods that are not part of the class don't have access to these uh, to these variables to these values anymore, and so a completely unrelated method that's um, somewhere outside of that class, uh, even by accident, can't now can't uh, modify any of the data that that's encapsulated inside the class and that basically belongs together, and. If the methods need data from outside, then we pass it as a parameter that is then used for um, for doing whatever that method does with the internal data. Um, but it's, for example, now not possible anymore um, to to modify the the by accident to modify the air temperature inside that method, even if it's just by accident. Um, and that would, of course, then cause other side effects that we don't want. So the fundamental idea of encapsulation is that uh, all related data is encapsulated inside the class and only the methods uh, provide a way to access that data from outside. All right. So um, what's also important to keep in mind here is that uh, each of these data and method items have so-called visibility or scope. Um, that means who can access them. Uh, and there's usually four levels uh, in Java which we can give to each item inside a class. It can be public. This is usually a good idea for the methods. If you look back to the previous slide, of course, the methods should be accessible from outside so we can mani manipulate uh, the data through the methods. Um, on the other hand, uh, data items should usually not be public um, because otherwise everybody could uh, could manipulate them from the outside and the whole point of encapsulation would be gone. Um, so for that reason, there's higher levels of protection. There's an explicit level called protected, which means that it's only visible to derived classes. We'll talk about that in a moment. Then there's package visibility. This is the default in Java if you don't give it any other um, any other visibility level. That means it's visible to all and accessible to all um, other classes inside the same package. So if you have several classes that belong to one package, then they still can access each other's um, variables, for example. And if you really want to make sure that a variable is only visible to the other uh, members of the class and the methods inside that class, then you can declare it as private. Um, so as a rule of thumb, um, you shouldn't have uh, public members, uh, public variables or uh, methods, unless you have a good reason for that. Um, well, for methods, it's not such a big deal, but for for uh, variables, it's better uh, usually better to not make them public unless there's a good reason, because otherwise the whole point of encapsulation is lost. All right. Um, so I already mentioned that an, another big concept of object-oriented programming is inheritance. That means that you can derive new classes from other classes. Um, you have a superclass, which is sometimes also called the parent class, and derived from that, uh, you have a child class, which is also called subclass. And the most important aspect now is that the members of the class are inherited from the superclass. So you don't need to write everything from scratch again, basically. You can use all the uh, methods and variables that are already already present in the superclass. You can also use them in the subclass and you can introduce extra methods and data items and so on to produce some kind of specialization. Uh, so one very simple example would be that you have a superclass which is called Rehycle and which has already methods like Accelerate and Brake. Um, and then derived from that you have for example a car class or a bike class. So this is the superclass or parent class and these are the subclasses or child classes. And um, the relation between these uh, classes is often also called the is a relation. That means bike is a kind of vehicle and car is a kind of vehicle. So um, the uh, the 
implicit uh, uh, result from this is, of course, that you can always treat every bike like a vehicle, and you can also treat every car like a vehicle in this uh, in this context. Um, this is also related to the, the concept of polymorphism. I already mentioned that subclasses can introduce new um, variables or uh, methods to kind of specialize uh, their behavior. Um, subclasses can also overwrite behavior. This is a very important part. Um, that means that if you introduce a method that has the same signature as in the superclass, so signature here means that it has the same name and parameter types, um, then that original method from the superclass is overwritten and uh, whatever you write in your new method in the subclass will then uh, be the actual behavior that's executed when that method is called. So as an example, let's say that uh, the vehicle class we have uh, we had previously has a method shift to change gears and then now we have quite different behavior of course for a bike and a car. So both still have a shift method but uh, does quite quite uh, different things internally um, and uh, whenever now I have a vehicle object I still don't have to uh, care about what exact type of vehicle it is whether it's a car or a bike I can always call shift and what's actually going to happen inside the vehicle then depends on whether it's a bike or a car, but Java will then select the appropriate method for me, depending on which individual subclass it is, and will execute different behavior depending on that. And uh, what that also means is that I can always take an object of a subclass and cast it, upcast it so-called, uh, it into a var variable of type vehicle, for example. So I can have a container object that stores uh, vehicles and uh, these can be cars or bikes or even trucks or whatever I, I'm, I want to introduce. Um, and I call, can call exactly the same methods on any of these um, vehicle objects, but depending on what actual subclass it is, it will then trigger different behavior. And that is the, the fundamental idea behind uh, polymorphism. All right, um, one thing that's also worth mentioning, which is not a, a fundamental part of object-oriented programming, but it, which is still quite helpful from times, are so-called generics. And uh, their primary use is to create uh, class families. So let's say we want a container class that contains other object, then we can create something using this generic notation. So this means that there is a generic type T that we use inside our uh, container. And then later on, we can have a string container or an integer container or a container for some something other, other maybe for vehicles like we had in the previous example. And the big advantage is that I don't have to write a lot of repetitive code every time I need a new container. I can just write the container class once and then put in any object I want, any sort of object. And um, I can also make sure that I don't have too many, so I'm, I'm avoiding potential pitfalls at runtime, because in a string container I can only put string objects. If I have some kind of generic container written uh, using other methods, then sometimes uh, even if the container would actually be designed for strings, I could put in all other sorts of objects too. All right. Um, Let's continue. Um, so much for the fundamentals of object-oriented programming. Now let's uh, have a look at how object-oriented design works. So I have some kind of system specification, uh, some kind of external uh, requirements that tell me how a system is supposed to look like, and I now want to basically modularize this. I want to uh, decompose that system into objects that are um, should be manipulated and which I then can write my code uh, for but 
I need a way to find those objects. And there's the uh, two kind of fundamental um, design processes possible. What's very important is that both of them are iterative. So it's not like you can read the specification and immediately come up with a, with a list of classes that you can implement. It's rather like you have to uh, start implementing uh, maybe a first prototype and then you will very soon see that maybe you are missing some classes that need to also be implemented and so on, or maybe that you can actually merge classes because they have very similar behavior that you first considered separate. Um, and now we're going to look at these two approaches. First is what I'm calling data-driven design here. And the other one, the actually more important one, is uh, responsibility-driven design, which is kind of the standard now. Um, oh, sorry, that was the wrong direction. So data-driven design means that I'm focusing on the data which is inside an object. And a very, very common example is that you're modeling a university, which is, of course, uh, where you are all, uh, all are right now. So we have a student class, which has a name and a student ID and a list of courses. And the courses have uh, a name, of course, and then they have a, a teacher and a list of requirements and so on. And that means that the classes usually quite uh, quite exactly match some kind of real world object like the student or the, the course as an entity. And if you have categories in the real world, then this is also modeled by having classes and subclasses. So you have a class person and uh, one subclass of person would be student and another subclass would be, uh, would be teacher or professor or whatever. And uh, you have a superclass course and subclasses like lecture and seminar and, uh, and project and thesis and so on. So um, this is actually quite straightforward. And uh, for some scenarios, it's actually perfectly fine to use this approach. Um, the problem sometimes is that where do you actually put the, the so-called business logic? So what? Uh, the, the program code that actually processes the data. And uh, in many cases, what this ends up with is that you have some kind of manager class that uh, handles all the, the other classes and uh, yeah, manages them and uh, modifies the data and so on. And this is actually a bit contrary to the core concepts of, of object-oriented programming. Of course, up to a certain point, you can, for example, uh, put a, a function enroll into, uh, into the course object, and that is, can then be called by a student object, and it will check if that student is actually allowed to take the course, and so on, and so on. Um, but in many cases, what you end up with is some kind of, of central class in the middle that's managing all of the rest, and the other classes are just like data storage object. And when you write something that's kind of like a database, something like this university management system I, I mentioned as an example, or something like an inventory management system for a store, then this approach is often fine enough and works. But um, for many other applications, which are not quite as data driven, um, there's another approach which may be better. This approach is called responsibility-driven design now. And here I'm not focusing on the data inside an object anymore, but I'm now focusing on the functions which it performs. And um, there's three basic steps. One is to find the candidate classes in the system architecture. So we go through the list of uh, requirements, um, and I'll show you an example in a, in a bit. Go through the list of requirements and find which um, which objects are you know, candidates for classes. Then look at the responsibilities these objects would have, and then look at how they would collaborate. Um, now we have less of a connection to real world objects like now classes um, have names like order processor or course catalog so now they're more related to specific functions than they are related to specific entities um, and when we have subclasses they now don't reflect categories from the real world anymore but they now reflect that these classes have specific behavior in common and I think this is best 
again illustrated as the, uh, at an example. So um, we look at we look at the system specification in a moment, and uh, nouns inside that spe system specification are now uh, a primary uh, source for candidate classes. Of course, if we discuss the system with other people, then there will also be nouns mentioned, nouns for entities, objects, and we usually also have some kind of background knowledge about the, the problem domain. And all nouns that appear in these, um, in these yeah, uh, thoughts and, and texts, these are uh, candidate classes. And now let's come to an example. So um, the student council wants to install a jukebox in the student center and there are some requirements. Students are allowed to play a song. It doesn't cost money. Um, if you swipe your ID card, then uh, you can choose a song and um, you have up to 1500 minutes uh, worth of music free while you're at the university but you can only play two songs on one date and you can uh, not play uh, um, Rick Astley th 20 times one day. All right, um, and now the nouns here are already underlined. So these are candidates for classes. That's a lo quite a long list. And if we uh, collect these into a list, then we get um, the student council, jukebox, student center, and so on and so on. Um, five times a day is like a compound noun, 1500 minutes and so on. Um, we also have a bit of context, so we probably will need some kind of stereo um, uh, to, to actually play the music and that has some kind of amplifier and speaker. So these might al also be candidate classes. And now comes the point where we need to, to weed out here uh, this list a bit and figure out which objects are actually prime, uh, prime candidates to, to turn into, into code. Um, and there's a couple of guidelines to help you doing that. So uh, we should also only use one word for one concept. Um, song and music can be interchangeable, so let's say we have a candidate class song. Um, the students and ID card are in this context also like the same thing, so let's just call that account. Um, then we shouldn't um, model the attributes themselves as, as objects, we should put those into, into um, class attributes. So for example, 1500 minutes and two songs and five times per day can be turned into attributes of song and account. So one song can keep track of how many times it's been played on one day and the account can keep track of how many songs that person has already played on that day or in general. Um, then one rule is called be wary of adjectives. This doesn't apply here quite as uh, as well, but um, anything related to adjectives should also be turned into attributes in general instead of classes. And last but not least, you shouldn't um, go too far beyond the problem domain. That means that like the student council, uh, the student center, uh, the, the, the speaker and the stereo and so on, those are not really things we need to model in our application. So we can, uh, can also remove that. Um, the next step now would be to determine the responsibilities. This is on the one hand which uh, the, the knowledge which a class um, maintains and the actions or services it can perform. So responsibilities are something uh, which you can think of as public services. So at, at a very low level this is kind of a, a client server approach. That means every class uh, can be both at the same time. It can be a client which uses some services from other classes and it can be a server which exposes services that then other classes can use as a client. Two classes can have both server client and client server relation at the same time. That doesn't uh, isn't ruled out. And um, if you think about it this way, then uh, like as responsibilities, one of your candidate classes can have then this already sets you on a very good track to, to having like a first prototype. Um, so for example, a song could have of course the responsibility to play itself, 
but look at how many times it, that, that was already done. Then uh, the account could be allowed to, to choose a song, also again with a limit. And then maybe we have a, a, a wrapper object around the whole thing that's called Jukebox that um, has a, fun, a responsibility to manage the login. And if it was confirmed with the ID card, then it will return a, a account that will in turn will re uh, return a song if it works properly and that can then be played. All right, so this was how to determine the responsibilities. Now, last but not least, we also need to look at how the individual classes collaborate with each other. So the question here basically is, which class does need another services. So um, to figure out how many times the song was played on one day, we might need to uh, have something like date time, of course, and maybe a little database in the back end. Um, for the jukebox, we will probably need some kind of account manager that actually looks at the student ID, if it's valid and so on. And if we uh, draw these collaborations uh, on, on paper, maybe even just, then we can al already kind of see the basic data flow through the system. And we can also figure out what's still missing, what we didn't figure out from just looking at the, the list of nouns in the, uh, in the description, in the discussion. Um, so we never discussed like a date time object, of course, but this is still something we need if we're dealing with, with time spans, for example. All right, so yeah, that's it for the second block. So thanks for listening. And once again, please make sure to ask questions uh, in the Moodle message board. If you, if anything is unclear, I, I'm more than happy to uh, go into more detail on, on any part that might need a bit more uh, explanation. All right. Thanks. thanks.